Will your 3D printer let you down when you need it the most? Today we're exploring why you should identify weaknesses in your machine and how to do it. Part of my job in running this channel is reviewing new 3D printers. And when I do so, I try to test them thoroughly enough to expose weaknesses so you can make an informed decision. To achieve this, I have a series of checks and tests that are outlined in my review policy. But maybe you've already got a 3D printer and you're quite happy with it. Well, I'm gonna try and convince you that focusing on the negatives rather than the strengths is actually a valuable thing. But before we get started, Every situation is unique. So what is a weakness in one setting is inconsequential in another. So with that in mind, here are some pertinent questions to consider. Our first question is, how do you use your 3D printer? Is it a tool or is it a hobby? There's a bunch of people that use 3D printers these days as a means to generate income. For some, their 3D printer is a tool to create the product they need to generate income and nothing more. For others, the 3D printer and tinkering with it is their hobby they might actually spend more time working on the printer, upgrading and customizing it, than they do printing other objects. And they also might like to experiment with interesting ideas released by the community, simply because they find it enjoyable. Of course, this is not black and white, and I see it more as a spectrum. Personally, I'm somewhere in the middle, but it even varies from printer to printer. There's some I don't want to fiddle with, because I want them to just work, and others that I constantly tweak, because I enjoy trying out new parts and ideas. Our next question is what aspects do you prioritize for your 3D printer? If you're not sure what I mean, here are some attributes that you might differentiate between when comparing printers. Again, this is going to be different for everyone. Personally, when writing this list, I reflected on what was most important for me, and here's my preference reordered in three different tiers. For the types of things that I usually print, quality just needs to be good enough. So what I really care about is my printer being easy to use and being reliable. What I really want in a printer is trust, and that means after I hit print, I don't have to be anywhere near the machine because I'm confident that the first layer will go down without issue, and if I come back later on, the print will complete without any failures. I care a lot about refinement, as in machines being nice and quiet, and I also care a lot about reliability, because as much as I like playing with 3D printers, I want to do it on my terms, instead of being forced to do it when they break down. So why don't I care about material versatility? Well, that leads me to the last question. Do you have one 3D printer or many? For many years, all I had at home was a single FDM 3D printer, which had to be a jack of all trades. However, if you have the luxury of multiple printers, you can cater them for specific needs, such as enclosing and heating the printer for filaments that like to warp, or fitting a specialist extruder to convert a 3D printer to a dedicated flexibles printing machine. Again, the quantity of printers is a spectrum, and your priorities will change for a single machine versus if you're running your own print farm. So even if every situation is different, there's still a number of concepts that hold true when finding weaknesses. So let's work through them now to see where you can improve your machine. The first area I normally cover in a review is unboxing and setup. And in the scope of this video, that's kind of useless because the setup for your printer is a setup for your printer and there's not much you can do to change it. So really in this section, we're actually addressing tools and spares, which is something I typically show in this segment. So assuming our printer at one point will need some type of intervention, it's probably best to identify the first potential weakness as whether or not we have the resources we need to work on the printer. You should start by looking at the tools you have, including those that came with the machine, and expand from there if necessary. To assist with this, I've linked a guide I have on 3D printing tools and spares below, as well as a specific video related to doing your own wiring, including the tools that you'll need to do your own crimp connectors. We're going to move on to print quality, starting with the fact that demonstration prints from the SD card are not indicative of print quality. Most 3D printers come with a small white roll of PLA, and typically there'll be a pre-sliced job sitting on the SD card, and more often than not, it'll be a decent looking print. But here's why you should ignore it. White as a filament is good at hiding defects and there's nothing to stop the manufacturer from tweaking the G-code, maybe by slowing down the feed rate or upping the temp to make it glossier in an attempt to exaggerate the quality of the printer. These test prints are really only good for verifying nothing is broken with the hardware. So how do we find weaknesses in print quality? 
we're going to examine print quality area by area and the first of those is consistency of extrusion. For every review I do, I make sure to print something in VARS mode. In case you don't know, VARS mode is a setting in the slicer that instead of producing the usual stacked layers, creates the print using a single outline that corkscrews upwards. On most printers, VARS mode prints look quite good, but sometimes the extrusion system produces erratic results and this is particularly evident if we shine a light from behind through the thin walls. There's a number of things that can stop your filament from flowing properly and I've got them listed under filament jams on my troubleshooting page. Single wall prints are also great at exposing layer strength issues that might otherwise be masked by the bulk of the print. Sometimes it's actually the filament that is the weakness, with bad extrusion caused by moisture in the filament, with the solution actually being to dehydrate the spool. Next up for print quality, we're looking at surface artifacts. One surface artifact that doesn't need any special prints to show up is bulging near square corners. And if this is your printer's weakness, I'm pleased to report that the fix is both free and effective in the form of linear or pressure advance. Linked below, I've got a guide to tuning linear advance in Marlin and a video on tuning the equivalent pressure advance in Clipper. Another surface artifact to look out for on your printer is ringing or ghosting, which is when the vibrations in the machine cause the geometry to be repeated across the surface of the object. The fix for this might be as simple as tensioning your belts, but typically ringing will present itself once we start to up speed and acceleration. So how do you find the exact point where ringing becomes too much? For this, I'd recommend using the G-code generator on my free calibration website that will let you produce a single tower with multiple acceleration values, and that will very obviously demonstrate where the ringing becomes too much for your particular taste. But what if speed was one of your priorities in a 3D printer, and you just need to print fast without any ringing? Your first option is swapping out hardware on your machine to equivalent parts that are much lighter. Less mass equals less inertia, and with that comes reduced vibration and ringing. The other option is something like Clipper's input shaping, which uses magic to cancel out resonant vibrations. If you're interested in that, I've just made a dedicated guide, including how to tune everything automatically with an accelerometer. Other artifacts that might be present in your prints are stringing, or obvious zits from layer changes. In these cases, the weak link is most likely your slicing profile. And again, you can use my free calibration website to generate retraction and temperature towers, which should be a convenient way of finding the best settings for your particular printer. Next up for print quality, small features and overhangs. In any 3D printer review I conduct, I always print some sort of decorative model, preferably with a steep overhang like the cape on this Mandalorian model. The reason I do this is to test the printer's part cooling capabilities. If the part cooling system is not up to the job, small features tend to melt into a blobby mess, and overhangs tend to look bad as well. If you want a dedicated cooling torture test, there's plenty on Thingiverse, including one of my own which I've linked below. It will help you test bridging, as well as steep overhangs, but from all four directions, to make sure you don't have a weakness just on one side. There are many printable aftermarket part cooling upgrades available, and I'm of the opinion that you can't have too much part cooling. For certain filaments, and or if you're printing fast, you want as much cooling as possible, and for everything else, you can simply turn down the fan speed. That covers several aspects of print quality, but what if accuracy is more your thing? The way I see it, there's two aspects to testing dimensional accuracy, and the first is printing an object of a known size, such as a calibration cube. You can then use some calipers to measure the external surfaces and see how close they are to the target dimension. If you do find that your dimensions are a bit off, I've linked my calibration page for this down below. It'll take you through the theory and then a range of different fixes. Most of the time, once you get the cube accurate, this will translate over to other real world prints. However, to know your machine is truly accurate, you need to test it with something that needs assembly. Whether it's multiple printed parts that join together or an all-in-one foldable design like this R2-D2 from Fab365, your dimensional accuracy doesn't really mean much unless your parts still work in their real-world application. It's possible that even if you can print a cube perfectly, other factors such as poor part cooling or an overly squished first layer are enough to prevent your finished print from being successful. So if your accuracy is good enough, what about testing how fast you can print? For this one, it's simple. Get yourself onto the Annex Engineering Discord, look up the rules, and attempt the Speedboat Race Challenge. 
I've got a video linked on my experiences with this. It will take you through the importance of filament choice, part cooling and hot end flow when it comes to printing really fast. It'll also illustrate what areas are important in terms of slicer and firmware when you're trying to get down your print speeds. I do most of my printing in PLA, but for other people, it's going to be the opposite. So how do we test for material versatility? When reviewing a 3D printer, I always make sure to test TPU, PETG and ABS on top of the usual PLA. The first aim is to find immediate problems. Things like excessive bed heat up time and whether a certain material sticks to a certain build platform. Sometimes adhesion is very difficult and other times adhesion is too good, damaging the bed as the model is removed. When printing TPU and other flexibles, you want to make sure that you can have a decent feed rate without the extruder jamming. And even if your first prints come out great, there's still longer term considerations. For instance, the maximum nozzle temperature a 3D printer can handle is often exaggerated by manufacturers. And that's because on many printers, the PTFE tube extends down inside the nozzle. And as the safety page on the Capricorn tubing website says, PTFE tube will off gas if heated too high. So if you're planning to print high temp filaments often, it makes sense to switch to a higher grade tube or consider installing an all model hot end to remove the tube completely. Let's move sideways from the actual printing process to find some less obvious weaknesses. Let's start with auxiliary and safety features. 3D printer manufacturers love to advertise a range of features. So the question is, have you actually tested if they work? Have you printed the whole way to the edge of your bed to make sure the auto bed leveling system works or have you only printed small objects in the middle? Your printer might come with a filament runout sensor, but have you actually tested it? Some printers don't have a way to manually remove the old filament and their interfaces are very lacking for doing it that way. The same goes for power out protection. You might find that when the power's off and the bed cools, your part self releases and it's going to be destined for failure no matter what. The point is that you shouldn't take the manufacturer's word that these features just work. I certainly don't when I'm reviewing a machine. Fortunately, something else I always test for that's generally present in the firmware are safety features such as thermal runaway protection. I've got an old video linked that explains what these features are and how to test for them, as well as showing what can go wrong if they're not present. You don't want to learn this lesson the hard way. So on to the final and most important point. It takes time to test 3D printers thoroughly. You can't do it on your first print. The thing about 3D printers is that they can seem perfectly fine up until the point where a component fails. Some problems just won't show up until you have enough hours on the machine, and that includes single long prints and a reasonable quantity of prints overall. This doesn't just apply to component failures, but also to usability. A printer that didn't seem that loud actually becomes tiresome over time, or maybe the bed leveling springs don't have enough tension, causing the first layer to be erratic and produce artifacts. So even if you don't mind manually leveling the bed, it might end up wearing thin and push you towards an ABL system. The point is that not all problems will be evident straight away and some will develop over time. So to truly find the weaknesses of your 3D printer, you have to be prepared to play the long game. Over time, potentially the weakest link in the chain can be your own complacency, so please don't forget maintenance. If you're unsure where to start, I've got a guide for that linked below in the description. In case you weren't sure on the purpose of this video, it's actually twofold. The first is to shed some light on the review process that I follow, and the second is to transfer that knowledge to you. You might be perfectly happy with your current setup, but in the future, you might have a new type of print, which is time critical, and that's not the time that you want to suddenly find a weakness. Maybe this video made you think about your priorities in a 3D printer. So let me know what they are in the comment section below. Thanks for watching, and hopefully there's some food for thought there next time you're happily 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you like the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.